Number 8. Culture Only humans have the capacity to develop complex cultures that advance over time. Again, two points, one sentence. I'll deal with the second one, the one that says that only humans can advance over time first for a change. Given the context, it's clear that Brooks is talking about the culture advancing. So, what is culture? In brief, culture is everything that is transmitted through social learning in a society, rather than through, say, genetics. So, is it true that this sum of learned information advances over time only in human societies? Of course not. That would require that either non-human animals cannot learn, or that they can never, ever happen on something worth learning by others neither of which are true. So returning to the first point, that's where the sneaky word complex comes in. We don't call what non-human animals have culture, right? But why? Well, there have been attempts to distinguish human culture from the sum of learned information available to the non-human animals. The most direct and blunt approach is to flat out say that culture is uniquely human, but that assertion gets us nowhere. Obviously, there are differences, we intuitively feel them, but what exactly are they? Language, for one, but I've dealt with it in part 3 of this series, so what else? A more scientific approach, offered by a developmental psychologist Michael Tomasello, argues that the beginning of the human culture lies in so-called imitative learning, which he differentiates from emulative learning, a very well observed and documented phenomenon in apes and even other animals. What's the difference between imitative and emulative learning? Emulative learning is focused on getting the result, while imitative learning is focused on copying the actions, even if the actions do not produce an immediate result. Imitative learning, according to him, is what creates an exponential learning effect and endless feedback that created what he calls the ratchet, that led to the creation of human culture and civilization. For the last decade and a half that has passed since then, there has been a large number of papers that argued whether this view is correct and whether non-human animals, or specifically great apes, do indeed not possess the capacity for imitative learning. Tomasello and his colleagues addressed a lot of them in a 2009 paper, Ratcheted Up the Ratchet, on the evolution of cumulative culture, where they have argued that most or all of the results that were put forward to refute this still in actuality support their hypothesis though they did had to admit that they were mistaken in downplaying the effectiveness of emulative learning. Their point was advanced by a 2012 paper, where they performed an experiment showing that chimpanzees fail to imitate novel actions. So is this it? Is this the key difference? Something uniquely human, ability to imitate novel actions, even with no immediate result? Uh, not really. Even in this same paper, Thomas Salon and colleagues state plainly that chimpanzees can imitate actions, they just do it much worse than who they were compared to, human children. So it's clear that the difference is not some insurmountable barrier that evolution cannot overcome. Indeed, as you might have noticed, Thomas Salon is explaining exactly how it might have been overcome by evolution. The point of contention in this scientific debate is details of evolution, not whether it occurred or not. With that said, let's continue. Michael Tomasello, director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. Oh, there he is. Well, I sure is not feeling weird for including the opinion of a person clearly accepting the validity of the theory of evolution in support of belief in creation. But in any case, I've dealt with this already, right? Michael Tomasello, director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, asked, How are humans unique? In a piece for the New York Times, he wrote, when you look at apes and children in situations requiring them to put their heads together, a subtle but significant difference emerges. We have observed that children, but not chimpanzees, expect and even demand that others who have committed themselves to a joint activity stay involved and not shirk their duties. When children want to opt out of an activity, they recognize the existence of an obligation to help the group. They know that they must in their own way, quote, take leave to make amends. Humans structure their collaborative actions with joint goals and shared commitments. End quote. Huh. So that's the part that you've decided to quote, Rice. Well, I can sort of see how it is related to culture. Very, very tangentially. Why did he not include it in the part about morality? Wouldn't it be more appropriate there? You know, the whole concept of fairness and obligation? 
It's like Tomasello's name appeared somewhere in the literature related to the evolution of culture, and the first quote that had something to do about how humans and non-human animals were different was picked and used with no regard to the rest of the content of the quote whatsoever. Well, I've dealt with the issue of fairness in non-human animals in part 5 of this series anyway, so let's move on. This is a point that philosopher Merlin Donald also made very well in his work, A Mind So Rare, The Evolution of Human Consciousness. As Donald wrote in the prologue, quote, This book proposes the human mind is unlike any other on this planet, not because of its biology, which is not qualitatively unique, but because of its ability to generate and assimilate culture. The human mind is thus a hybrid product of biology and culture. End quote. Great. This is... Perfect. I don't know how one could have a quote that is supposed to support his or her position that is in actuality more undermining of it than this one. Not only the author of the quote is another scientist recognizing the validity of the theory of evolution, he plainly states that biologically human mind is not unique in any way and all the differences from non-human animals' minds are, in fact, acquired through social learning. It's almost as if Brooks thinks that it's enough to just find some difference, or rather find someone who found such a difference, and quote him or her, and that just completely obliterates the theory of evolution right there. Bad news, nobody says that humans aren't different from other species, that'd be silly, but what you claim twice is that these differences cannot be explained by evolution, and atheism, whatever that means, so would you mind getting to the point where you show how the theory of evolution fails to explain them? because you kind of forgot that part, and it's uh, kind of important. And for those of you who think I'm being overly quick to say that, since there are two more supposed differences, I'm really not. You'll see in the next and last part. That's right, there is just one more part left, and it's going to be very obvious why.